Food is more than just what's on our plate. It's the places where it's grown, it's the people who grow it, and so much more. Join me, Janice Person, your host, on Grounded by the Farm every other week as we talk about the foods we love. Hey, everybody. It is so weird to be interviewing this person. I met Lee Hickey in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, and yet at the same time, there were like crowds of people from all around the world who had come into this one little town. It's in Sonora. It's called Obregón. And it's where a lot of breeding research was done. If you read into history and science, if you follow the Nobel Prize, you may have heard of a man named Norman Borlaug. Lee and I met in a wheat field in the middle of Obregón. And what's so funny is you were on the other end of the microphone. You were not having to do an interview that day. And I had a friend of yours that I had on camera and on microphone. And I remember you giving him a hard time, Lee. Do you remember that? <laughs> I do. Uh, yeah, it, it's great to connect, Janice, um, again, since those years ago and in the wheat field in Mexico. Yeah, you're right. We're giving him a hard time. He was a wheat breeder from Morocco actually and but yeah you, you were talking to him about some of the science and breeding it was actually great to be there in Mexico because it brought together all of these scientists working on wheat from around the world to celebrate Borlaug's birthday which was pretty cool. Yeah it was one of those moments in history I think where I got to be someplace that other people were like, oh my God, I've always wanted to go there. And that's a really ag nerd kind of place to even think, ooh, wow, I really want to go there. But it also explains a little bit about what you're doing. I usually talk with farmers on the show and you're not a farmer (laughs) and you didn't grow up a farmer. No, definitely not. I definitely grew up in the city. Yeah. In terms of my upbringing, I was very far from any farm. I'm going to go ahead and give the clue away. You are not from Mexico. Your accent does not relate to Mexico either. You're from Australia. Are, are you from Queensland? That's where you are now. I guess. That's right. Yeah, I'm from Brisbane, pretty small city on the east coast of Australia, not too far from the Great Barrier Reef. So if you've, if you've heard of that before, it's a beautiful place to go to. Yeah, I think most Americans know Sydney, Brisbane, the Great Barrier Reef. And then there's like everything else in Australia. (laughs) (laughs) It's turning a tourism uh, advertisement, isn't it? Sorry. Right. (laughs) Well, maybe Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, gave, you know, some of the Western territories some (laughs) time. But when you're doing work now in agriculture, is Queensland like the biggest area for agriculture in Australia or are there other states that are really important? Yeah, I mean, agriculture is very important for all the states of Australia, I guess. In Queensland, it's quite uh, tropical to subtropical. So the crops that we grow are quite different to the southern states, which have a much cooler climate. Yeah, just different crops and different types of production, I'd say. Right. And what crops are you talking about working with? Or are you not really crop specific at all? Uh, Yeah, well, I started off working a lot on the genetics and breeding of wheat and barley. That's the two main cereal crops that we grow here in Australia. It's very dry. Wheat and barley are are great crops. They're pretty drought hardy, I'd say. But, you know, one of the priorities is trying to make them even more drought tolerant and use water smarter on farm. But more and more, we're moving to working on some of the exciting technologies that we can help speed up the development of our crops and really working across crops in general, because these technologies are universal uh, in how they can be applied to different species. Yeah, I'm going to admit that at one time before I worked for a seed company, I can remember even working in agriculture, I had no idea of the amount of plant breeding work that was going on and why that was going on and what it delivers for farmers or what it delivers for people like me. Do you have an easy way of explaining that? Yeah, well, I, I'd i say, you know, if we travel back in time, you know, the original plant breeder was the farmer. In fact, over hundred and or sometimes depending on the crop thousands of years farmers selected and retained the most productive plants and they grew them you know the next season and and essentially that's what gave rise to what we call land races of many of our crop species and it's really only been the last hundred years that we've actually started more targeted plant breeding so actually making targeted crosses you know crossing one plant with another one that has a, those different desirable traits and applying intensive selection 
to improve productivity and all the different traits and even traits like flavor and, and end use quality, which is really important for a lot of our foods. One of the talks that I heard you give, I think it was at the university there in Queensland, you talked through sort of broccoli and Brussels sprouts and kale. That's probably one of the best examples of plant breeding. It was forever ago, but would you mind explaining that? Because I think it helps people understand, at least in principle, what plant breeding does. That's right. It, you know, when, when people hear this for the first time, it really blows their mind that you know, a lot of vegetables that we have all come from the same plant. They're essentially, they're all brassicas. Brassica oleracea is the original plant. And through plant breeding and selection for different traits, we've created crops or, or food crops like broccoli, Brussels sprouts. And just by selecting for, you know, different attributes. So to create Brussels sprouts, there was a selection for buds, stems for broccoli. And you know, it's pretty amazing how, you know, we can create the whole range of different vegetables that look like totally different species, but they all come from the same plant. Yeah. And it's crazy. Yep. I mean, it's kale, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts. I mean, it's like this wild combination of yep. things. And all of it is because somebody looked at the plant and said, I really like that part. Or that part seems great on this plant and let's save some seed and plant that and, and do the best of the stems if they were a broccoli lover or the buds if they were a Brussels sprouts lover. They don't exist in the wild. You know, humans have literally created these, these plants that we eat almost every day and are pretty nutritious and, 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 and pretty good for us, right? So it's pretty amazing what plant breeding can do. Right. And so then when you move it to a scale that we're on today, we're not necessarily coming up with new vegetables, although sometimes people do. But you'll do things like, I remember talking to a bell pepper breeder, and he wanted to make sure that the bell pepper had four lobes so that if you wanted to stuff the bell pepper, it would sit evenly on the pan and not fall over because a stuffed bell pepper, once it's fall fallen over is not going to look great on the plate. <laughs> it's, it's very practical. <laughs> so there's some of those things. There's also some things that are around flavor or whatever, but in every crop around the world, there are always people working in plant breeding. And we're going to talk to another one soon that's actually working in Morocco. We're going to talk to Priyanka Gupta this summer. Oh, wow. She's going to talk to us a little bit about some of the work over there. But I just wanted to make sure that people kind of understood that because before we get into the rest of your story of what all you're doing, it's a good idea to understand plant breeding at the basic level. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and so this is a, a constant effort to try to select and improve these traits. And when we think about a lot of our broad acre crops, like maize and wheat, plant breeders are constantly trying to improve traits like disease resistance. Diseases, these pathogens are constantly mutating and overcoming resistances that we breed into our crops. So, you know, this is a pretty big challenge. We've often got to go back to these rather ancient land races for new diversity, for resistances and all sorts of traits, and then cross them or breed them back into modern materials. It's a similar challenge we face around climate change as well. We need a whole array of new traits to basically you know, equip our crops with these mechanisms that make them more robust in the face of warmer temperatures, more frequent drought episodes. And so, you know, a lot of the materials we have stored and preserved away in gene banks around the world are really valuable materials for this purpose. Yes, you're talking about drought and pests and stuff. And seriously, you remind me of having worked with some cotton breeders in Gundawindi and Narrabri and, and some other places. And it just made me kind of laugh because I think Australia is like a prime place to do plant breeding because, yeah, I mean, you guys have more things that want to kill us. You have all the problems like drought and really bad diseases that come in on plants. You guys really know how to challenge plants and people. Yeah, it's a tough place in Australia. It's very dry. The rainfall is extremely variable. And if we think of a crop like cotton, there wouldn't be a cotton industry in Australia if we didn't have technology like GM traits. So, you know, we're talking about insect resistance and Roundup ready. And so a lot of people in the public maybe don't quite understand how these traits work for you know, the environment and for the farm. 
and preserving water and making all this possible. But it's pretty amazing what these type of traits can do in terms of productivity in an agricultural system to make it more sustainable. I think you've worked a lot on drought, haven't you? That's been one of the areas that, that you've worked on maybe more than others. Yeah, that's right. We have a strong drought theme in my uh, lab here in, in Brisbane, really looking at ways we can deploy different traits and technologies to improve the drought adaptation of our crops. There's no magical gene for drought resistance. It's all about how you use water more in a smarter way through the season to produce a crop. I want to kind of come back and talk a little bit about how you found your way into agriculture <laughs> because you're like so deep into PhDs in plant breeding and things like that, that it's hard for me. You said earlier that you grew up in the city and we were really far away from farms. How did you make those connections somehow? Because now you're sitting here telling me about this in-depth drought research. That's right. It's a bit of a strange, a strange uh, story. I, I'd say uh, I grew up in the city and I was pretty strange kid, I suppose. I was pretty obsessed with uh, my veggie patch <laughs> and, and growing vegetables in the backyard. I don't know how that came about. I would literally, you know, run home from school to tend my veggie patch. Uh, <laughs> that's how keen I was. And, you know, I'd be looking in all the growing guys and the time of sowing for the different vegetables and the row spacing to maximize yield. And yeah, I guess it, that, that curiosity for growing food and you know, just giving it to my parents or the neighbor was kind of cool. And I, I, I like this a lot. I guess that's what sparked this passion, I suppose. I think it's really interesting. I remember as a kid, our family garden together, it was really cool to harvest your own food and be able to eat it. I think maybe I ate some vegetables that I may not have been as interested in had I not grown them myself, but it was really kind of cool to be able to see the outcome. Like you do this and, and plant growing a plant to feed yourself. You see it in months and, and maybe weeks on some whereas it doesn't take years like plant breeding. So you, you get a little reward on the way, right? Yep, definitely, yes. Well, I was particularly good at growing chocos. I don't know whether you've tried choco. It's a type of vegetable, it grows on a vine, and it's, oh, it's, it's just terrible uh, to eat. It's very bland. It, I would say it's disgusting, but <laughs> and I, I, would, I would basically produce so many chocos and trying to give them away to the neighbors, they would refuse them. So in the U.S. we have zucchini. Is that, that's what everybody does with their zucchini squash? Yeah, that's right. They grow that's so right. many, Similar, yes. they like put them on your, your doorstep at night when you, when you don't <laughs> know they're there, you suddenly find more and more of them showing up. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So you were really good at it. I think your part of agriculture and your part of plant breeding is especially the kind of part that could get people who don't necessarily know agriculture very well interested. So you get all the cool toys. You do something called speed breeding. And do you have disco lights in the like greenhouses and stuff? That's right. It's it's a catchy name called speed breeding, but it kind of resembles a disco uh, for the plants. Essentially, what we're doing is we're growing plants under 22 hours light. So it's almost continuous light. We give them a little period of dark to rest. You know, it's pretty different to what they experience in the field or in a, in a, in a paddock or in your backyard. You know, this extra light is triggering early flowering and enables us to grow a really fast crop. So essentially, this becomes a really powerful tool to turn over generations that are needed for the plant breeding process. We're talking about, you know, reducing the time frame for developing a new variety for a farmer to grow from, say, about, you know, 12 years mm -hmm. you know, down to seven or eight years. I just want to say it sort of happens in nature when in the northern hemisphere, if you go up to Alaska, there's a certain period of the year where you can get really big plants or really big vegetables and things like that because you have such photo intense days yep. and the same in the far southern hemisphere at different times, but it's a very short window. That's right. And so this is all about controlling the photo period, the light, the light quality, the temperature, controlling those factors all year round to rapidly cycle these crops and 
So we're talking about growing up to six generations a year for most of our crop species where the technique has been optimized. Yeah, I've, I've been working with different plant breeders and organizations around the world to help set up these facilities for a whole range of different crops. We're talking crops like millets and sorghum, and wheat, barley, even starting to work on banana <laughs> seed breeding. We can really develop these techniques for any, any type of plant. I giggle a bit as you say banana, but in parts of Africa, that's a primary starch in a diet. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really important that we're doing research on some of the foods that are culturally important in different parts of the world. It's just for us, bananas are typically a snack or something you add to breakfast cereal or something like that. And in some parts of the world, it's a much more important part of the diet. Yes, I have a banana every day for breakfast. And look, banana breeding is pretty challenging because we've bred out its ability to produce seed. Uh, no one wants seed in their bananas. However, the big challenge is there's a big problem with fusarium that is a disease that attacks banana. And so we really have to bring in new sources of resistance into our modern banana varieties. And I guess, you know, these technologies like speed breeding can help speed up that process. Right, and so fusarium and other diseases can either cause the plant to wilt, it'll get a bacteria that creates a fungus, and basically it starts to interfere with its ability to process light and photosynthesis, is that? That's right, it, the mycelium, basically the pathogen, uh, clogs up the whole plant and, and the plant can't suck up water. So that causes the wilting and eventually results in the death of the entire plant and then it can wipe out, wipe out an entire crop. It spreads very rapidly. Um, so it's a pretty terrible disease. And it's certainly, I think a lot of people have heard about like the Irish potato famine and things like that. So in bananas, there's not a lot of genetic diversity, like it's very closely related, right? Yeah, that's right. And you know, going back to some of the wild bananas for sources of resistance is great, but to transfer those resistances through so many cycles of crossing events is very, very time consuming. You know, we're talking decades here. So that's why I guess some of the new technologies like uh, genome editing can help us modify some of these key genes uh, that are needed for disease resistance directly in the elite varieties. Is that part of the Nobel Prize winning work this year on CRISPR and some things like that, right? Some researchers in California, I think, Jennifer Dodna. Yeah, you're right. That's right. It was <laughs> very exciting. And the applications to plant breeding in terms of traits that or characteristics that can be targeted are virtually um, unlimited. There's a really good book. I'm going to have to remind myself what the book is, but there's a, a great book on that whole topic because I think CRISPR, it, it can sound hard to apply if you're not familiar with plant breeding and you're not really familiar with the science and stuff. The potential though is if you find something in plants that's causing it a big problem, you might be able to kind of cut that one little tiny thing out. That's right. Is that there's two main components, guide uh, and an enzyme for cutting uh, the DNA. And so the guide is a sequence that tells the enzyme where to cut the DNA. And that can be very, very precise. So we're talking about, you know, modifications in a known gene. Um, and so if you compare this to the old school technology of just, you know, shooting in a gene anywhere in the genome, it literally goes in randomly anywhere. And, you know, you could be causing other sorts of uh, problems as well. But you know, this new technology is so precise and refined. It's very exciting, you know, improving our, you know, agricultural crops and, and, and animals that we grow on farms. And I think part of it that's really cool is because the other type was a little less precise, there had to be a huge amount of testing that went on right. to find out where you had problems and things like that. And because of the precision of this on the front end, you don't have to do as much screening. You can check it pretty quickly and you know it's pretty damn good. That's right. The, 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 the modifications to the, to the gene that can be created in this way are very similar to or virtually undetectable or, or you cannot tell the difference between this type of change and naturally occurring mutation. So that's how good it is. Plant breeders have taken advantage of natural mutations occurring up until now and, and, and the farmers when they were breeding the original varieties thousands of years ago. I guess we're just using this technology now to 
to induce these mutations where exactly where we want them to make the process a bit more efficient. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk about one of the other super cool versions of what you guys do. You guys fly drones a lot. What are you doing with those? Because it really looks fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what what are you doing from like a, you're not just chasing them, you know, having races in the field, but there's a lot of actual work going on with drones in agriculture. Oh, we're just getting cool Instagram videos, really. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> we're, we're, we're actually doing work. What we're doing is we're fitting drones or UAVs, pretty high tech sensors. You might have heard of remote sensing, which is done, which, which can be done from space using satellites. The UAV or drone technology has, has gotten so advanced that pretty much you can, anyone can buy a drone and fly it now, mostly without crashing it. And the sensors that we can fit with these drones ha have also advanced rapidly. So we're talking about sensors that can capture you know, different wavelengths and even uh, temperature, uh, which is really critical or pretty important for measuring different traits in the field that we're interested in. So, you know, traits around measuring the, the canopy of the crop to determine how drought resistant it is, how much stress it's experiencing in a particular environment. We can use these sensors to capture very vast amounts of information and data that we can use to help support our selections in the breeding program. Yeah, and when I see those pictures come back, they, I know they're, they're maps or they, they show all this stuff that they've been sensing, but sometimes you say the canopy on cotton, the leaves are normally somewhat parallel to the ground when they're doing well. If they've dropped down to where they're more like at an angle, then you know it's drought stress if you're able to look at the different crops, right? If you're looking at different plants, but in a field that's hundreds of acres and you've got various different varieties or hybrids and things out there to have this thing be able to fly through there and pick up that kind of information and detail throughout the season all the time without you having to write it in a notebook and then try and put it in a computer in a spreadsheet and oh absolutely i mean, I mean the plant breeding is a numbers game so yeah, we're talking about evaluating thousands and thousands of different lines in one field. And you're right, it's very labor intensive. We either need a whole army of people to evaluate those thousands of lines, or now we can use drones fitted with these sensors to more efficiently capture that information. And one of the exciting uh, thing around the technology too is measuring traits that the human eye can't see. Things like a thermal temperature for the canopy can be indicative of stress that, that, that the human plant breeder wouldn't have been able to select and identify in the past. So it can make this whole selection process much more efficient as well. Mm -hmm. In a year where so many of us have had a thermometer put on our foreheads or something <laughs> to see if we can go in for a haircut or whatever, it makes a lot of sense, right? But you're talking about a drone that's flying over the crop that has that same kind of sensing ability, and it can tell whether the plant is already heating up. And sometimes that's based on the soil that's there. Sometimes it's based on the variety. So we still need really smart people to work with all the technology. Yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> well, you, you, this is certainly the era of big data. And, you know, gone are the days where even in this field, plant breeders can walk around the field, visually make selections, or at least rely on this. You know, we're capturing vast amounts of genomic data through sequencing and all this data from our UAV platforms or drone platforms. You know, the skill sets that we need is really around analyzing and interpreting that big data. You know, coding is pretty important like a lot of fields. Yeah, right now we're in the process of planting in the US. You guys have been trying to finish up harvest, is that right? Yeah, yeah for some crops. So the summer crops just finished, um, you know, sorghum and mung beans. We grow a lot here, uh, not so many soybeans here in Australia. We have, I guess, less rain. And so, yeah, they've just finished harvesting these crops and about to plant the winter crops. So wheat and barley, are just being sown by our farmers at the moment. Yeah, I think wheat and barley are the ones that here we've we've had some really good years, and then some years the winter just doesn't cooperate very well. Right, you miss the rains or you get flooded. Either way. Oh yeah. But we've actually talked about uh, barley with 
not only a farmer who, who did barley, but one of the places in Nashville that buys barley from him for craft beers that they make. So we're trying to pass along a lot of those kind of tips and information to folks too. Yeah, well, I mean, who doesn't like a craft beer? I mean, I mean, <laughs> if you're going to be traveling around, you're, you're probably going to want to drink. So um, stop and get something nice and uh, local. Well, that kind of covers the topics I had. I, I do want to let people know we're going to put links in. So you, your lab is called the Hickey Lab at the University of Queensland, right? That's right. We'll share that. There was a recent podcast you were on that goes more depth on plant breeding and some of the things you're doing. I've got the TED Talks that you've done. Are there some other ways that people ought to get in touch with you? Yeah, if I mean, if you're curious, you can reach out to me on, on, on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. My handle is at Dr. Hickov, so D-R-H-I-K-O-V. I use a lot of social media to promote some of our science and communicate this, the things that we're up to. So I might see you online. I think the, the role of science Twitter has gotten unbelievably awesome. I mean, the number of scientists that are out there communicating different things blows me away. And I love being able to connect to people directly. And a lot of the time, you know, when we put this stuff up on our website, people will then want to go check these folks out, you know, then they can see what kind of test you're doing. I know you guys do a good job of sharing here's what's happening in the field in sort of real time. So I'd encourage people to find you on Twitter. Definitely. Uh, thanks so much for having me. So everybody, that gets the end of the conversation with Lee. I'm going to put some of this up, all the links in the show notes and on groundedbythefarm.com. Please tell your friends if they have kids that are interested in technology and maybe interested in plants that we need more people like them in this field of agriculture and technology. I don't know if you guys have thought about it, but we've got a lot of food to grow for ourselves and our neighbors over the coming decades. And we need more young, smart people in the industry with us. So get them connected up. They can also look at Grounded by the Farm. We're trying to do more things for kids there to help them find the excitement of agriculture that people like Lee and I have learned. Thanks, Lee, so much for joining us here today. It was so good to have you on the show and talk about plant breeding and this sense of discovery and interest and always finding new things to learn in the world. We talked a little bit about that from the childhood perspective uh, but I think a lot of us carry it well into adulthood. I know I certainly love to discover new things and learn new things. We are, this summer, going to have an intern working with us on some of this space of education and children and how to bring more of the kind of content we've produced here at Grounded by the Farm. Make that more accessible to parents who are homeschooling or who are teachers who are interested in getting agriculture into their classroom. If you have any ideas around that, if you've got things that your children have thought really stand out in an episode, or if you're a younger listener and you've thought there were some things that really stood out to you, or other things you've learned at school, other materials that you think we ought to be aware of, please share that with us. You can find the contact form on groundedbythefarm.com, but you can also get us by email at groundedbythefarm at gmail.com. Thanks so much. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode and look forward to talking with you then.